Today I'm going to show you how to make a superfood that will last a lifetime without refrigeration. And it's so nutritious you'll never have to stockpile another food. The food's called pemmican and it was widely in use by the natives of North America and also by the Western explorers who would go for months without contact with civilization. In the 19th century, even British soldiers had an iron ration of four ounces of pemmican. Many of these iron rations were found intact and edible as much as 50 years later. So let's just avert our gaze from modern survival thinking for a minute and let's think about how the guys who explored the West 150 years ago did it. Now that's exactly the kind of stuff I found in this 350 page book called The Lost Ways. It's probably the only survival book I've actually enjoyed reading and you won't believe the survival things we've lost to history. Now I found the pemmican recipe on page 48 and I decided to give it a go. Natives used whatever was available to them at the time. Bison, elk, moose, deer, but nowadays people just use what they can buy. You just need to remember to select a low-fat red meat and beef is perfect for this. So you'll need six pounds of beef, two pounds of rendered beef tallow, and a third of a cup of strawberries or blueberries. And that's it. Don't include nuts, seeds, vegetable oils, grains, beans, or dairy products of any kind. Now the first step is to dry the meat and blueberries. First you need to slice the meat very thin. You can use a very sharp knife like this one, or you can keep the beef in the freezer a few hours before slicing it. Now place a tin foil on the right side of the rack and spread the blueberries out to dry with the meat. Place the rack back inside and crack the oven door to prevent moisture buildup. Let this dry for about 15 hours or until it's crispy. 150 years ago, people dried their meat by building a wooden pyramid over a small fire and hanging the meat slices on that. After 15 hours, this is what you should get. Toss it in the food processor until it becomes a powder. Do the same with the blueberries. In the old days, they grind it with a rock to crush it into a powder. Generally, well-dried meat will weigh just slightly less than one-third of its raw weight. Therefore, six pounds of raw lean meat will yield about two pounds of thoroughly dehydrated meat. For our next step, we need to cut the fat into small pieces about a half inch square. So place the fat in a pot on the stove and heat it up to a temperature between 225 and 250 degrees. And you don't gain anything from getting it any hotter than that other than destroying the fatty acids, which we want to do as little as possible. Now for the first 10 minutes, you want to keep this on medium-high heat, and you want to stir it about every minute, and this will allow enough of the fat to be liberated to coat the bottom of the pot without burning the bottom of the fat. After about 10 minutes, you'll see a pool of fat forming on the bottom of the pot, which should be merrily boiling away. Uh, you can rest a little bit now and stir it maybe only every five minutes, just to keep things well mixed. After about 30 minutes, the liquid fat should have risen enough to cover the chunks, and it should look like a rolling boil. So as this liquid rises, you can go ahead and lower the temperature down to about 230. After about an hour, the major boiling action will have stopped, and there'll just be small bubbles rising from the fat. About 90% of the cracklings will be a chestnut brown in color. So use a strainer to separate these, and set them aside with salt, to enjoy as snacks later. They're really, really good. And if you don't like them or don't want to eat them, you can set them aside to cool. We now have to weigh the amount of ground meat 
and the amount of rendered animal fat. We have to have the same quantities. So you'll probably have to remove some of the excess fat. Place the remaining fat on the stove. Keep it about 120 degrees. Mix the shredded meat into the melted fat and stir it until it's well blended. Then add the blueberries and mix it again. This is how it should look. The fat should be absorbed or coating the meat fibers. There should be very little or no liquid fat pooling in the bottom of the pot. Now, following the instructions from the lost weights, you can store it in Ziploc plastic bags and press flat, removing as much air as possible, and therefore preventing the fat from going rancid. This should keep the pemmican from spoiling for a few years without refrigeration. So let's do that. And here's what I got. Pemmican is the ultimate survival food, no matter if you want to bug out or bug in. 10 pounds of pemmican would supply food for two full weeks of camping activities at three quarters of a pound per day, providing 2,200 calories. In survival mode, the same 10 pounds of pemmican would supply energy for almost a full month. This was just one awesome chapter in the Lost Ways, but you won't believe the survival skills we've lost to history. And that's what this book is all about, saving our forefathers' skills. I personally happen to know the man behind this book. Claude is an old-fashioned guy by any standard. He lives with his wife and two children in a log cabin he had personally built, cooks outside on an open flame in a cauldron most of the time, and all of his clothes are handmade. He has a 150-square-foot root cellar stuffed with all sorts of homemade canned foods and goods, and he raises cows, sheep, and chickens. I thought several times to myself that this guy will never be troubled by any crisis because the SHTF we all prep for is what folks 150 years ago called daily life. No electrical power, no refrigerators, no internet, no computers, no TV, no hyperactive law enforcement, and no Safeway or Walmart. They got things done or else we wouldn't be here. In the next seven minutes, Claude will unearth a long-forgotten secret that helped our ancestors survive famines. Wars, economic crises, diseases, droughts, and anything else life threw at them. A secret that will help you do the same for your loved ones when America crumbles into the ground. He's also going to share with you three pioneer lessons that will ensure your children will be well-fed when others are rummaging through garbage bins. In fact, these three old teachings will improve your life just as they did for me immediately once you hear them. My name is Claude Davis. You may know me from my website, askaprepper.com, or you may have seen my warnings in the media, but few of you know me personally. My story is emotionally heavy, with struggles and disappointments, but also with a faith in God and a strong will to survive that finally led me being here. So pay close attention, because this video will change your life for the good. Lesson number one, don't take anything for granted. My grandparents from my father's side came to America from Ukraine just before the Second World War and started a small farm in Texas where I grew up without missing a thing. But my grandfather wasn't so lucky. When he was only 12 and still in Ukraine, he survived one of the most horrific famines. Of the hundred families that lived on his street, only 20 survived. So what you're about to hear is a real recollection as it was written in a personal journal just after the crisis by one of his neighbors. Where did all the bread disappear? I do not really know. Maybe they've taken it all abroad. The authorities have confiscated it, removed it from the villages, loaded grain into the railway coaches, and took it away someplace. They've searched the houses and taken away everything, to the smallest thing. All the vegetable gardens, all the cellars were raked out, and everything was taken away. It was so dreadful that every day became engraved in my memory. People were lying everywhere as dead flies. The stench was awful. Many of our neighbors and acquaintances from our street died. We tried to survive the best we could. We collected grass, goosefoot, burdocks, rotten potatoes, and made pancakes, soups from putrid beans or nettles, collected glay from the trees and ate it, ate sparrows, pigeons, cats, and dogs. When there were still cattle, it was eaten first, then the domestic animals. Some were eating their own children. I would never be able to eat my child, 
One of our neighbors came home when her husband, suffering from severe starvation, ate their own baby daughter. This woman went crazy. Another neighbor wrote a petition to the authorities, and here's just a paragraph from that, said, Please return the grain that you've confiscated from me. If you don't return it, I'll die. I'm 78 years old and I'm incapable of searching for food for myself. And of course, nobody cared. In a crisis, it's everyone for himself. Although in many cases, families did still remain families. But just after the winter, when there's absolutely nothing to eat, my grandfather, together with his mother, went to the nearest town where the government had established a soup kitchen. Unfortunately, the 25-mile journey was too much for his mother. After just five miles, she couldn't walk anymore. My grandfather noted in his journal, Mother said, save yourself, run to town. I turned back twice. I could not bear to leave my mother, but she begged and cried, and I finally went for good. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm a father myself, and when I read these things, I burst into tears. Now, please allow me to take a wild guess here, without getting mad at me. Your life's not perfect, but at least you have a computer or a mobile device to watch this video on. Your fridge is probably half full, and while you have your problems, starvation is not one of them. And even though your job or retirement could be more enjoyable, you probably have enough money to at least get by. And that's great. But make no mistake taking this for granted. History has shown us many times that it can all fly away in a split second. The biggest misstep that you can take now is to think that this can never happen in America or to you. All that my grandfather and our ancestors who came here and formed America lived through would be in vain without lesson number two. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now call me old-fashioned, I don't care, but I completely believe in America and what our ancestors stood for. They all had a part in turning this land into one of the most powerful countries in the world. Many died and suffered before a creative mind found an ingenious solution to, maybe, a century-long problem. Now, believe it or not, our ancestors' skills are all covered in American blood. And this is why these must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same for our children and our children's children. But now, my friends, we're sitting on the edge of oblivion. Our fathers and grandfathers were probably the last generation to practice basic things like building a root cellar or making pemmican. Our ancestors laid the bricks and built the world's strongest foundation that we're about to irreversibly forget. And we're going to pay the ultimate price for this, because if you have a big, strong house with a weak foundation, it doesn't matter if it looks nice on the outside. The next flood will sweep it away. And that is exactly what will happen to most Americans in the coming crisis. So here we are, human beings in the 21st century, several lifetimes and a world away from our grandparents and their ways. Have we become better at living? I think not. I watch as we have become ever more expectant that the world owes us a living. Consumerism has reached epic proportions and people feel aggrieved if they don't own the latest gadget. The truth is, we never have been more disconnected from life, from the world, from the soil, 